Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Talk Assassin's Creed. This is episode 171 and uh, this is going to be a good one. Uh, first of all, uh, welcome back. I'm joined by my co-host Chris. Hello everyone. Good to have you back, mate. It's only been a few days since we last uh, chatted with uh, Leo and uh, Hayate to talk about um, the gameplay of Mirage and we are doing another Mirage themed episode today and we're joined by a very special guest, Maria Lewis. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you here and thanks so much for accepting a, a random invite from uh, two uh, podcasters on a pokey little um, Assassin's Creed <laughs> podcast. We're really pleased to uh, speak to you. Well, I have to say thank you to you guys because what the listeners don't know is that we rescheduled this interview twice because of my fault because um, I had quite severe tonsillitis and pharyngitis and so literally couldn't talk and huge thank you to you guys for being so flexible um, with getting messages from an Australian at weird <laughs> weird <laughs> times of the day and night being like, I'm so sorry, but my throat's closed over. Can we postpone? It's all good. We've all got, we're hot tea. We are ready. Our voices are prepped. Exactly. Um, so that yeah, was actually the worst part, to be honest, is not only was I banned from speaking on a liquids only diet, I wasn't allowed to have hot tea for three weeks, which, you know, oh, I really? made me want to kill myself. Why don't I? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, glad you're better. Really glad we're all here. Um, so, I mean, let's let's just set the scene. So we're recording um, right at the end of November. Um, it's been a couple of months since Mirage released. It's been about a year since we saw the first game trailer and we saw this new character, this mentor of the Brotherhood called Roshan. Um, and I got to say, she left an immediate impact, um, I think, on everyone that saw that trailer. And um, Maria, you you got to write the book that fills out so much of her backstory and her her character that we see um, on screen. Um, we have prepared many questions. Chris and I have both read the book. Thankfully, we got um, early access, which was great. Um, so Chris, do you wanna get us started? Yeah, no problem. Um, so first off, um, could you describe a little of your previous works before you started writing Daughter of No One? Um, I think Dot of Norman is your 10th novel, is that right? It's my 11th, but you're so close. 11th, <laughs> so close. Okay. And how did it how did it feel starting out on this project? Well, it was it was really interesting. Um, and also you saying it's my 10th instead of my 11th is like no big deal. Because uh, I had somebody congratulate me the other day on this being my debut novel. And I was like, no, babe, I have been around oh, for what no. feels like 86 years sometimes. No. Uh, so I have a... a can, can I just say, can I just say, so... I wrote that question. I went onto your website. I had a look at all your previous novels. I thought I'd counted them correctly. I'm really sorry, but I'm glad I didn't mess it up and put debut novel. No, That's honestly, good. like the difference between 10 and 11, who gives a shit? Um, but so I have a previous novel series called the Supernatural Sisters series, which is um, uh, eight books, all bestsellers uh, and award-winning books here in Australia. They're in the fantasy genre and they looked at mythological monsters with a feminist twist so sort of looking at mixed race identity through the lens of werewolfism um being a woman trying to find your voice through the lens of banshees so taking those classic sort of monsters that people knew from different mytho mythological stories in different countries and giving them an upgrade and sort of like a modern lens and using different types of women to explore different types of stories so female characters of different ages, different ethnicities, sexualities, backgrounds. That was sort of the the prism through which I was exploring that. Then I had a, a Marvel novel uh, with the character Mockingbird, Bobby Morse, who's an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. and a pop cultural slasher called The Graveyard Shift, which came out earlier this year, which is basically like Scream for Gen Z, if you will. But the Supernatural Sister series in particular was probably most relevant in terms of writing Daughter of No One because each of those books played in different time periods. And even though all of the eight novels are set within the same world, each one has a different main character. So there was an interplay and a world building that was actually a great prep for a, a book like this and for a world like this. And then I had done obviously the Marvel novel, but I had also done some work at DC Comics and sort of understanding how to balance IP and how to balance characters that have 
a huge fan expectation, but also have a lot of built-in canon is a very specific skill to learn and can be really quite tricky actually, especially when you're used to sort of like writing your own world or, or playing in your own world. My main job is in the film and television space. And so a lot of the work you do there is scripting original characters or coming up with original characters in a group setting because, you know, film and TV is a team sport. So it was sort of a perfect meshing of all of my interests and skill sets in one. And the way it was pitched to me, like the way that the project was first um, popped up is I had worked on a previous project in-house at Ubisoft for four years and it was a gaming project. And then I had also worked with the publisher on this Marvel book. So again, converging interests if we've just been kicking around long enough. And someone, <laughs> my editor actually, the amazing uh, Gwendolyn Nix, who just has the most incredible name, pitched it to me as, hey, so you like history? <laughs> I was like, I, I do love history. Like, where is this going? <laughs> and um, and that was basically the slow roll into, um, you know, we're looking at, you know, uh, doing a series of novels sort of set in and around a forthcoming Assassin's Creed game, Mirage. And uh, the character of Shine, you know, has been kicking around for a while, as most AC fans know. But uh, having the opportunity to basically establish canon for a legacy character like this is so rare, so rare. Uh, because, you know, part of her whole thing is like being mysterious and you don't know much about her background. And they really had like three or four tentpole things that had to be in her backstory. And then the rest was just like, you know, you give us some solutions and like, pitch us some ideas and we approve them or not approve them. But, you know, they gave me space to cook, which was um, very, very exciting. It's awesome. Um, I would love to ask about that four years of game project, but there's probably a big NDA slapped on <laughs> yeah. top of that. So yeah, we won't, we won't, we won't dive into that this time. Um, you've kind of touched on this already. So um, you already had worked with Ubisoft. Um, you had the right skill set. Did you need to pitch for the job, writer, story treatment, or was it a case of, Maria, you've got the skills, you're in, let's go? Oh my God, could you imagine? I don't think that, <laughs> I don't think they'd ever risk I, it. I, I should but... clarify, we are not literary experts. We have no idea how the industry works, but you know. No, it's, it's more just like for a brand this big and for something that has such beloved IP like this, um, you know, no matter what it is really, uh, but in, in the case of the way the process of this worked, hey, do you like history? I love history. Cool. We were thinking of doing this idea. Could you pitch us a story? And so the way it works and the way it worked with the Marvel novel as well, and the way it works for most of these IP properties, same in, in my work with DC as well, uh, is that you usually pitch several options of stories and there'll be a quite small synopsis, you know, maybe 50 to 100 words on each and you give them a few options. In the case of this book, um, I think I pitched five potential stories. Uh, two get flagged, you expand on those two, and then one gets locked in as this is the one we like. And then it's a, a pretty lengthy process, honestly, of you expand each time. So by the time you're actually greenlit, approved, ready to go, you have gone through an expanded synopsis. Detail In film and TV, you would call it a treatment, really, which is basically like a prose version of what the script will be. And it's usually about 4,000 words in this case, and each plot beat needs to get approval from Ubisoft. In the case oh, of wow. Marvel, it was each character that I used needed to get pre-approval that I was able to use them. So in um, Mockingbird Strikeout, which is my novel with them, Bobby Morse obviously is the main character, but I also wanted to have her work in this team called Team B, like the B team, but it stood for Team Babes rather than them being like the more shit version. And so that team was She-Hulk, Maria <laughs> Hill, Tigra, right? Who aren't necessarily what they would consider um, tier A characters, but they are characters who have legacy and, you know, are important. So you have to get approval to use those characters in case somebody else is already using them. And even characters like Bobby Morse was married to Hawkeye, right? So like, you've got to get approval to use Hawkeye. I have Daredevil as her divorce lawyer. Um, sorry, as Hawkeye's divorce lawyer and Jen Walter, She-Hulk is <laughs> her. So stuff like that, Lance Hunter using Strike. And the same same thing with Assassin's Creed, obviously because this was Rashan's origin story and she doesn't get 
it's it's leading up to how she's first exposed to the brotherhood in this case called the hidden ones at the time so there is minimal crossover at least so dot, dot, dot. so you think in terms of pre-existing assassin's creed characters there is some intentional easter eggs that i put in there and things that overlap with other assassin's creed properties and even stuff like that is you have to get approval from ubisoft about whether right. it's okay to like wink to this thing or maybe you've done 10 winks and they're like which is i think actually from memory because it's been a it's been a minute but I think I was like trying to shoehorn <laughs> too many <laughs> Easter eggs in there because there's, um, in particular, there's an Assassin's Creed manga that I really love that is quite uh, close to this time period, even though it's a mm. different geographical place. And so I was slipping in a few references to that. And they're like, listen, the two references you've got are probably enough. Could you maybe call it on, um, <laughs> on the little acknowledgements, which I think is cute. But I just, you know, it, this is the fun of getting to play with somebody else's toys is mm. if you're creating the toy mm. box, it takes a while before you've built up enough stuff and that your audience, whatever kind of audience they are, whether that's a viewing audience or reading audience, can recognize and acknowledge those connections. So Assassin's Creed being a legacy brand, those connections already exist and people already understand them and are hopefully excited to see them. And I think that's the beauty of Assassin's Creed is it is such a intricate and interwoven tapestry of stories across time periods across technology across characters so that was also you know one of the really exciting things for me about getting to play in the assassin's creed world there's little shout outs or little echoes to characters or moments from the games and the other extended media that you can you know just give a little hat tip to yeah yeah so that actually sounds like a lot of fun, being able to just think, like, oh, what can I fit in here? What wee nods can I fit out there? That's great. Yeah, so, it, was, um, it was, there was even a part where I was like, I had a bit, like a minor villain. And I was like, you know what? This could just be like fucking henchman number five. But is there someone in particular that you guys love who you haven't gotten to <laughs> use? Or like, you know, everybody who works on a Ubisoft yeah. project, which is usually hundreds, oftentimes can be thousands of people. Yeah. They all have a favorite and it's usually never your main character. Um, mm. And they all, they, you know, they all have a sneaky little person they want to see cameo. So just asking other people like, you know, who, who would you like to see in here? Because I, I can put them in. If you give me approval, I'll slip them in. Good stuff. So um, before I read this next question, I'm just going to preface it by saying I'm going to butcher the name and I feel so bad about it. But <laughs> you dedicated the book to, is it Shora Agdashlu? Honestly, I think asking a Scottish accent to get this across is it's, it's, it's like an extreme <laughs> level of difficulty. I know. Let's, this let's hear it in proper Australian. Go on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Shora Agdashula, you dedicated the book to her, mm-hmm. the OG. Did you have contact with her before writing, or did you get a chance to meet her at any part, to hear, or hear her audio performance? Like, how did you, how did this inform your, your writing? I would love to meet her. I've never met her. I'm a huge fan of Oscar nominated legendary actress. Um, if anyone, I'm, I'm mainly more familiar with her through her film and TV work. She's done a lot of voiceover work over the years, but uh, in the international cinema space and particularly in genre work, she's um, The Expanse, Star Trek, Punisher I was it's a smaller role but you know what I mean like I've, I've been a fan of hers for a really really long time um she was nominated for an Oscar for House of Sound Sound and Fog uh and Best Supporting Actress like she's just a, genuinely an icon who's been out there grinding in the business for decades and uh, I knew that she voiced the character of Rashad I had listened I had uh, some access to certain clips from the game and chunks of the script that would be relevant to the story you that's the really tricky thing with uh writing a story like this and part of the reason i pitched a story that happened way 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 before the game is because 
I was trying to sort of avoid any issues with plot clashes or things that needed to be too reliant on Mirage where, you know, you want Mirage to be doing its own thing. And I wanted this story to be doing that as well, but it's also a logistical nightmare trying to, um, you know, read this part of the script or read that part of the plot when the script can be pages. And it's like this team worked on this bit and there are little, you know, clips of gameplay that you're watching and whatever. Anyway, she is Rashan first to me. And so dedicating the book to her was just a respect thing. I don't think this character gets to exist in the way that most people access it without her incredible voice performance and without her getting across the, I want to say grit, but grit really like, you know, the grit and the perseverance and the steadfastness of a character like this, of a, of a woman who has seen a lot of shit and dealt with a lot of shit <laughs> And, you know, it has existed in a, in a place where, you know, brilliance isn't the exception. It's the rule. The whole brotherhood is made up of exceptional people. And um, for her to sort of, you know, be one of the masters within it is really significant. So for me, it was a respect thing. I have no idea. She knows that the book's dedicated to her. I would doubt that she does because um, she's a quite busy, famous, successful <laughs> woman. I don't know if she's spending a whole lot of time um, reading Assassin's Creed novels about a character she voiced. I mean, if you if you were listening to this and you work for the Ubisoft Transmedia Department, please send a copy of the novel to uh, Shore. You know, I'm sure she'd love some some flight reading or holiday reading or I don't know. There is a project I'm working on that um, I know she's up for. Well, like she's like one of the people that the you know it's it's like a, a television series. It's six episodes, limited series, like one and done. Anyway, there's only eight parts. And I know that she's um, sort of like one of the main people they're going for, for the key eight parts. And so I'm like, oh, fuck. Imagine if she gets it. <laughs> that would be amazing as you just have like, you know, the loser writer skittle up to her on set and be like- Are you oh, gonna be in full fangirl moment? I'm so happy to be you. <laughs> and listen, I wrote this TV series, but fuck that. Here's his book, <laughs> <from there. laughs> That would be great. I, I, I would just say you've sort of touched on this already, already, but um, when when we see Roshan in the trailers, when we see her in the game, she is a force of nature. She really is. And I think that's emphasized by um, Shoray's um, vocal performance. Um, again, you've kind of touched on this already, but did you take from the clips that you'd seen, the vocal performances, um, the, act, the actor's performances, and how did they inform some of your writing? Yeah, well, the tricky thing about Rashad in the games, obviously, is that she's a woman of few words, which is mm. like great and mysterious and cool. But then you're writing a book with somebody and you actually need quite a lo lot of words to do that. And um, it's boring if all of that is internal monologue or internal dialogue. And so trying to find a happy medium where it felt that she like, wasn't a chatty Cathy per se, because that's not who she is as a character. It's also not accurate for the social standing she was coming from at the time, but then also being something where you're allowing the readers to have insight and perspective into who she was to understand where she gets to. Because that's the thing with the book is the, you know, no spoilers really for many of the plot details, but by the end of the novel, we're at the point where she's joining the Brotherhood at this time called Headed Ones, right? So it's getting her to the point where she's joining. We don't actually see her spending time within the creed. So what mm. we want to understand is why she would make that choice and what they see in her to make her such a promising candidate when, you know, it's a time where being a woman was just surviving as a woman was impossible, let alone surviving as a woman of a certain social standing. And so that was also part of the reason I introduced the element of it's very much like a team up book, really. Uh, I saw somebody tagged me in the thing on Instagram where they were like, it's the suicide squad of Assassin's Creed. And I was like, yeah, man, I guess like shit, that's pretty accurate. I was thinking more Ronan at the Robert De Niro movie. Like I think that was actually the exact wording I used in my original pitch for it was I was like Ronan, but Assassin's Creed where, you know, you have a, a central MacGuffin that needs to be MacGuffined and you yeah. have a, a team of people who don't aren't necessarily familiar with each other, but all have, 
uh, to quote Liam Neeson, a very specific set of skills. And some of those people have good intentions. Some of them have terrible intentions, but for whatever reason, they have to work together as a team. And so part of the story is trying to establish who can you trust within this group? What are their skill sets? How is that relevant to you? And how are you going to survive this mission? And having Roshan's character and her personality and her integrity and her strength be revealed through action rather than it be something that's revealed unprompted, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Over to you, Chris. So how well, sorry, how well formed was the character of Roshan and what kinds of discussions did you have with the writers of AC Mirage? So they read the final manuscript of the book and provided notes and annotations, but they also looked at the um, expanded synopsis, like that 4,000, 5,000 word one, that was like the last sort of step before then off you go, Maria, go write the book. So they had provided feedback and notes on various aspects of that. And then I had also... Um, spoken with a friend of mine who wasn't working on Mirage, but has worked on previous Assassin's Creed uh, games, Jeffrey Yolaheim, who oh, was yeah. so insightful because not only is he a brilliant mm. writer, but in particular because he'd worked across multiple Assassin's Creed properties and because he'd worked, he works in-house at Ubisoft and has worked on various games for them, had a really great understanding of world building, like world building mechanics with in that world because at, at the end of the day like i know how to build a world but i'm trying to build a world within a world specifically for ubisoft so there's things that do and don't make sense in the assassin's creed world for instance um i think this is the only <laughs> novel of mine that doesn't have a sex scene <laughs> and so i was just like oh wow is that gross like maybe uh because all my stuff's like you know I feel like every book should have yeah. like some murder, some comedy, some spooky business and like some shagging, like horniness is like an essential <laughs> part of life and an essential part of stories. So, you know, that's cool. All good in the hood. Um, you were like, maybe, maybe less of that. I was like, fair enough. I'll, um, I'll insert a few more murders or whatever, or like, you know, pushing my personal agenda, which is, um, I I'm a Pacific woman and Assassin's Creed hasn't had, uh, very many if any sort of inclusion of pacifica elements in the story and historically where the games are set and where the novels are set that is something where i have been like really desperate for that and i think it's really rich story material so i was like you know what if i'm getting to be the architect of this story we're introducing a pacifica character which is a samoan warrior princess in this particular case and you know, making that relevant for the time period, giving her weapons that are specific to Samoan mythology, things like that. So there are certain elements of stuff that I'm bringing to the table, but then I have some sort of like landmarks that are set in terms of the Harbour Master storyline was something that already existed in her background. And I believe had been mentioned previously in um, Assassin's Creed IP. So it had to be something that was mentioned. But there was also, for instance, there's a letter that Roshan writes to somebody in Mirage. And the person that she um, writes that letter to is a character in the book. Now that character, you know, you're pitching a, a sort of like broad story originally, but that character from the book I create based on getting to see her writing this letter to somebody all these decades later mm. now is that something mm. that most people are going to pick up probably not but it's just trying to find <laughs> okay great excellent <laughs> I, the thing is i'm putting my hand up but of course this is audio so again yeah, this is stupid got it. To yeah. do. but we, we were lucky to get early early access to the book so when i was exploring i think the letter is in alamut mm. Uh, and when you, of course you play as basim but basim can wander around and read different letters and i think there there is a letter from Roshan to uh, to one of her friends from the olden days. Yeah, we say? which and, again, and like, oh, that's a nice little reference. Yeah. Well, it's it's also rare. It's like that's the thing about um, people within the Brotherhood is that you are not fully uh, aware of their backstories or like their past is meant to be left in the past, right? So this idea of friends and family and relationships is. Um, is how you touch into that and how you explore that can be pretty tenuous. But even the like 
mentor mentee relationship between Rashan and Basim. Like, obviously, he's too young to exist within the novel. <laughs> it doesn't even exist yet. But trying to find ways to sort of echo that story and to understand why she, what she would see in him down the line, and why she wouldn't want to take somebody like him on, I think is is important. Like, sort of trying to stay true to the tones and themes of aspects that you've seen of Rashan as an adult and how you're seeing that play out here in the story, which has a chapter in the past, a chapter in the present, but is basically juggling dual timelines so I can cover her from the age of basically about 14 to, to 24. Mm. I think we get to this a bit in a later question, but she she goes through some stuff yeah, at a young I mean, age and then for a number of years. You, you can understand why she... Uh, wants to join the, the the hidden ones to uh, try and affect society. Yeah, know, during that time in, period. In a positive way. Very few people had a good life, honestly. Yeah, indeed. Um, I'll ask the next question. I'll, I'll just explain to readers. This question, to be fair, you've probably already answered it, but I'll just explain why. Um, you can't just phone up an author and say, hey, can we chat about your book? You have to approach the uh, the publisher. Um, Chris and I had to write um, questions in advance and Ubisoft had to approve it, which of course we're fine with. Um, on reflection now, having written these questions a few weeks ago, some of them are perhaps a little bit repetitive, um, but I'll ask it anyway, because hey, you might you might think of an anecdote or, or something, uh, something extra to add. So, um, it must have been important to give Roshan, um, you know, consistent character growth between um, Daughter of No One, um, the game Assassin's Creed Mirage, and she has a short appearance in Valhalla as well as a final kind of closing story um, in the game Valhalla. How much collaboration and feedback um, took place between you and the Mirage narrative team led by Sarah Beaulieu? I would guess much of Mirage's story was complete, but am I wrong there? And did you have a chance to have any input into Roshan's character as it appeared in Mirage? Yeah, just the way the timeline works with those games, like even, you know, talking about the project, I worked on Ubisoft, at Ubisoft for four years. It's like, that was considered pre-development, like the tale on the way the gaming world works is astounding to me, truly. Mm. Like, I don't understand mm. how anybody gets anything done because they spend so much time and attention to detail and just like love and thought poured into every single aspect of the game, um, of every game they work on, even ones that aren't Assassin's Creed that maybe slip under people's radar. There's artists and cultural consultants and just all sorts of things, historical consultants, language consultants, before you even get to the technical aspect of building a game. So the game was locked by the time I was brought on to write the novel. Okay. So it was more about just um, getting access to any little pieces. I wasn't allowed to play or view the thing in its entirety, but um, I was given uh, permission and access to anything that specifically pertained to Rashan. So I was able to see yeah. cutscenes, um, view pieces of the script, stuff like that. Little bits yeah. and bobs of um, some of the incredible voice performance that had been recorded. But for the most part, just, you know, little snippets here and there, which can be tough because you're viewing them out of context, but you just have to sort of extrapolate and go from there. Obviously, as mm -hmm. mentioned, Ubisoft, um, you know, they provided me notes in the synopsis stage and in the final delivery of manuscript from Sarah and from the rest of the team. But also, um, you know, there were tentpole things that couldn't change about her story. Um, the area that she was from, the Harbour Master stuff had to stay. It was um, just making sure like those things can't change. So then you're filling in the gaps in between. And there would be suggestions that I would have that would like, for instance, obviously, like having sex scenes was like a bridge too far. So you roll that back or, it's, um, you know, finding out ways to have a murder or a death scene. That was actually one of the things is that I couldn't have uh, Rashan uh, actively murder anybody um, in the story. And so that becomes really tough because that's that quite a tight restriction in a game where we spend a lot oh sorry i know it's not a game in a franchise where yes. we spend a lot of time stabbing people yes uh, exact chris correct because <laughs> i was like wait wait what do you mean like it's really important that and we have said previously that when she joins the brotherhood the only person she has like you know really in intentionally murdered is this harbor master character that's um been mentioned previously and i was like all right that's really tough. So trying to find ways 
to not have uh like to be have her be active and defensive and offensive um mm. while also not um you know she's not an assassin that's the whole point of this book is it's like what gets her to the point of seeing that as a possible viable future she has mm. skills and she has talents and she has traits so like let's look at the time period about what they could be outside of physical prowess she obviously is physically gifted in a certain skill set that she learns from a certain character in a certain time period that's tied to a certain geographical place but also things like seemingly small stuff to us like being able to read and write during that time period were a huge superpower especially if you're a woman but then also being able to um you know do calculations mathematical calculations to be able to understand things like how to sail how to orchestrate through different parts of the world via boat to understand wind currents tides all of that kind of stuff all of those traits and skills and a, a part of the gameplay in Assassin's Creed and oftentimes the things that characters can already do because they're already part of the Brotherhood. But if this is pre-Brotherhood, then let's show her trying to understand those things. Let's show her trying to learn those skill sets and let's show her learning things from other characters that she picks up and takes with her going forward in the story so that hypothetically speaking if you do read this novel and you have played the game there might be a little a few things about Roshan or how she moves or how she operates or a skill set that she has that you're like oh my gosh that's how she got xyz thing now i understand blah 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 absolutely so Daughter of No One isn't your first novel. Uh, Mockingbird Strikeout, I think, would be your first question. Oh, with the, with this publisher? Oh, tie-in novel. Tie-in yes, novel. Yes, tie-in novel. Sorry, yeah. 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 Uh, just so, how challenging is it to write something that's already got existing characters in an existing universe? Like, what are the positives and the negatives? Positives? Uh, these are like I, I'm never pitching on something that I don't care about. Like I'm never pitching on an IP that I'm not super a familiar with or be passionate about. So the positive is you're getting to play in a world that you're excited about, a world that you love, a world that you're a fan of. I'm a fan first and foremost. So that's really exciting to me. Like I love Assassin's Creed. And so like just entertaining a possibility that I would get to play in that world and the world building for me is one of my favorite aspects of the story like it's i don't have necessarily a, a a specific game or even a specific assassin's creed novel where i'm like that's the one for me because i'm just excited to be immersed in the story and see where it takes you i love sort of um i call it alternate history but anything that's like historical tie-in is really interesting to me where you're starting to incorporate elements of a made up, a made up quote unquote story into parts of history that people know already or think they know. So that's the kind of thing that makes me really excited is, um, you know, <laughs> I've spent a lot of my time and most of my career coming up with original characters and original stories and original IP. And it's really hard. It's great because you have full power and full real estate, <laughs> but it is really hard to do creatively. It's also really hard to make people care about. So coming into stuff mm, like this, it's yeah. like a cheat because people already care <laughs> and so much of the work is done for you in terms of the world and so much of the mechanics of it. So it really is like getting to play with somebody else's toys. In terms of the negatives, there really aren't that many. I guess really the only thing is um, you have a stakeholder. It's like you really clearly have a boss in terms of, um, you know, certain things that you can or can't do. For instance, on Marvel, um, I wasn't allowed to swear, which I'm a quite sweary person, as I'm sure you've realized from the, you know, 20 minutes that we've been doing this conversation. I think most Australians and Kiwis are. So for a Marvel property, it's like no swearing. And also, um, like your characters can't kill anyone. And if there's violence, it has to be of a superheroic nature. So there's like little, um, I call them like no benders, like things like that, that just, you yeah. know, can't be tweaked, yeah. but Again, this isn't my first time with the IP rodeo. Like DC Comics had stuff that was very similar on the project. I worked for them for years. And so having done that, having worked for Marvel, having worked to places like AMC and Netflix, I was familiar with what you need, like how far you can push things and the things that you have to be willing to fight for. And also 
if you don't want to be told, no, this is not the job for you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you're coming into somebody else's world and a world that people mm. have spent uh, in many cases, decades working on. So it's a, it's a matter of being respectful as well. I know that if I had a, a writer coming into a, like Supernatural Sister Series or something that I worked on for years and have novels and, you know, expanded universe and there's fans who've drawn artwork and made podcasts and stuff, uh, I, I would appreciate the respect. So it's just about, I think, being respectful in return. Mm -hmm. I just, just a sort of a tangential question just popped into my head then um the franchise has been around for 15 years or six, 16 years this year isn't it um since the first game and you know the chances that people now creating the games writing the books will have played the games and had exposure and experience of the universe and the stories is just so much higher the early novels were just written by people who'd probably not touch the games you know just because gaming was a smaller business in those days but i think there's there's just a lot more chance now that you and others that that sort of join the media side of of this franchise you're probably already fans probably like people joining the marvel creative teams are now they've probably seen the films read the comics you know and it's the same with star wars isn't it the number of people now who are writing and directing and producing star wars um we my daughter and i we went to um the star wars celebration um in london earlier this year and quite a few of the people on the stage were like i loved the films when i was a kid and now i'm oh. here and i get to make my contribution to um you know the star wars universe and it must be very similar for for you and others that are creating for for this universe um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's one of the things, actually, this is a challenge that was tricky was, you know, on the Marvel project, for instance, you have the character of Bobby Morse has existed pop culturally for over 50 years, right? So you have 50 years worth of canon uh, to negotiate, 50 years worth of stories that there are some things that stick and some things that don't in terms of stuff that has to be in her backstory. Like she has to be married to Hawkeye. They have to get divorced, blah, blah. She has to get by going from there, right? But whether, you know, some versions of the story, she has scroll powers, some she doesn't. It's, you know, pick or choose different aspects. And Bobby's story exists in our current timeline, in our current world, over a span of really about 30, 35 years. Uh, for a character like Rashan in a world like Assassin's Creed, there is no limit <laughs> to the time period it exists within. So it's like literally from the birth of time to present day. That is the scope of it. <laughs> that is your sandbox that you yeah, can play Yeah, that is all the threads of the world exist mm. within that. And mm. so I remember like the first sort of time I was, you know, sitting down and going, and thank God Assassin's Creed has such loyal fans. But, you know, when you're just sitting down and sort of starting to pick through various timelines, it's like Assassin's Creed is so deep and detailed and there's so much depth to it that you pick any time period, any year, 891 or whatever, and any part of the world that exists, there's a quite detailed Assassin's Creed story happening in it that then ties in to something that happens 100, 200, 1,000 years later. So it's ve you've got to be very careful about where you train and making sure that you're not crushing like a little you know ant city that's been built beneath your feet so that was a really fascinating thing is yeah like not only have um the games and the novels been around for a while now and fans of them but the actual story itself now spans millennia so it's um it's broad it can be really broad i remember um we interviewed one of the narrative leads um darby mcdevitt nearly a year ago and uh, I remember one of the questions I asked him was, again, this is off topic. Sorry, Ubisoft, this is not on the document, but I think it's a safe question. Um, <laughs> one of the questions I asked him was, I think the, the Assassin's Creed fan wiki has something crazy like 28,000 articles. And I said to him, is that constraining? And he said, not really, because we've still got in countries and centuries we haven't even touched yet. So, you know, it's fine. Um, but yeah, you're right. There is so much characters and places and for every day of the year something is happening you know um, it's, it's truly nuts and again that's what i'm saying like i really hope we get to um get into more of the pacifica history and stuff because mm, I, I do really think mm. it's a rich the southern hemisphere has been um 
you know, largely ignored sort of in the franchise so far. And as you're picking through so many other types of history in the Middle East and, you know, Celtic history and things like that, there's a really, really rich story world and historical world um, where there's really damaging political figures that are getting killed in mysterious ways that you could just, I don't know, I, I just think it's rich territory in the mind. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, let me ask a, a question about um, the, the structure of the novel. Um, so the novel follows two timelines and, and we switch between them. Um, we start with Roshan escaping from a horrible situation. Um, and then we have a second timeline um, where she's, as you say, she's doing a heist, perhaps you could say. Mm. Um, so when, when did you decide to use that structure um, for the novel and follow those two timelines in parallel? and? Does that, how does that structure help build the character and build the narrative? Well, I think the sort of like modus operandi I had for this story was to sort of understand where she's going. You need to understand where she's been. And I feel like that way for lots of different characters and things, but the idea of the sort of like ongoing heist mechanic that is the main sort of narrative catalyst throughout the story is great. But for a character like Rashan, who's not super verbal and not um, super revealing in terms of things that she tells people about herself or about her past, that heist timeline happens many years after the Harbour Master stuff. And again, as mentioned, Harbour Master was a thing that had to be in there and that happens at a very specific age. So that's not something that was bendy in any way. It was like hard concrete cement. So what's realistic about how that story would come to the reader's attention? Is she recollecting that as a memory that seems a bit like wistful and takes you a bit out of the action? Is she telling that story to someone? I don't necessarily buy that that's believable. So it was kind of the idea of the dual timeline thing was out of practicality more than anything. I've done that in a few other novels of mine. So I was familiar with the actual like technical process and what could be gained, but also how difficult that can be just to make sure that it's always juggle with this kind of thing is making sure that the chapters in the past are as compelling as the chapters in the present. And you have to try and find a balance so that it's not weighted one way or the other. But then there's also things that are currently paying off in the story. So you begin to understand in the present timeline why she is the way she is based on stuff that's happening in the past. So it was a practical mechanic more than anything, but also it's a great way to be able to cover a breadth of time. Uh, the heist itself only really takes place over the course of a, of a few weeks. And I was constantly thinking about, you know, this might be the only um, piece of Assassin's Creed, Creed media where we get Rashan as the main character. So hypothetically, if that is the case and we never get to see her having this much story real estate again, I wanted to try and tell as much of that story as possible. Um, for the readers and for the people who are interested in her journey. That's absolutely fascinating because I really did enjoy the dual timeline story. It's not something you encounter very often. And uh, yeah, I actually really enjoyed the earlier timeline story. Oh, good. <laughs> that was my favourite one. Like, I like both of them, but I, there was something about the earlier timeline that I really enjoyed. So that's great stuff. Well, it's also like game mechanics, isn't it? It's like every char every skill that a character has in the game, you have that in any game, but specifically Assassin's Creed, you have that learning period where you have to, oh, you've got a new skill, but then you have to learn and adapt to that skill. So it's trying to like use game mechanics but in a narrative way in the book so that there was you know you can't be like control x or whatever the fuck uh <laughs> in the book, right but you know making giving people that similar sort of feeling of that every skill she acquires or every new ability she gets feels really earned yeah so roshan goes through some early trauma it kickstarts our journey towards the hidden ones we see in the games and other books that many hidden ones and assassins are driven by trauma to join the group. Was that hard to write? And how important is it to get the character's motiva motivation right? Sorry. Honestly, that time period was pretty fucked. <laughs> so, yeah. It's like everybody, uh, you know, I don't know what time period it doesn't make sense to join the Brotherhood. Like basically 
uh, you know, I was even trying to do this like in my head one time when I should have been writing and I was procrastinating. I was like, at what point do you get up to where you're like, I'm good actually. You know what I mean? Like life hasn't been that traumatic. So the brotherhood doesn't make sense to me. And I was sort of like the eighties and I was like, no man, if you were like, you know, deep in the trenches, if you're provost or in the troubles or something, you'd be like this, there's just trauma everywhere. There's war everywhere in every timeline all the time. And so it's just never not feasible for the mechanics of how the brotherhood was created to begin with and the purpose that they serve, the difference between free will and control and power and self power, the actual conceit of that as a concept, therefore begets this idea that you need to have, you need to have some kind of difficulty or some kind of, um, thing that you need to overcome or have been through or are still overcoming in order for you to be a candidate to join. Uh, so it was just like, this is the world. <laughs> this is the sand pit they made. So uh, if I want to play in it, I got to play in it. Were there any um, passages that were particularly difficult to write? I think language is always a big one. Uh, i am come from a journalism background, so I want everything to be as accurate as possible. And setting a book in this time period is very specific. But then it's also, if you are too, I don't want to say if you're too accurate, but if you're too hindered by the time period, then the novel isn't engaging to a modern audience. So it's really tricky because you're essentially trying to tell a story that feels modern in a very specific time period. It's a bit like any sort of historical um, action movie or like any historical epic is you have to put aside a certain type of like language accuracy, I guess, um, and lean in to the things that are compelling about the story. Otherwise it becomes a, a different type of book. So I guess it was what was hard for me or like what was difficult is just being, having to let certain things like that go and make the number one priority be, is the story entertaining? Are you engaged? Is Rashan driving this forward? And does this fit within the world of Assassin's Creed that has existed for, you know, almost two decades at this point? Mm -hmm. So. Assassin's Creed is a 15 year old franchise with a very complex history and lore at this point. Did Ubisoft team give you a briefing on key points? You already did say you were a fan. Mm. Um, did you have any prior, did you have to do any of your own research or did you aim to write something that anyone could pick up without prior knowledge to any of the games or books? So that was my intention was to make this book something that anybody could read. Um, Assassin's Creed is a passion of mine, obviously, but I come with an audience who are attached to me, who perhaps maybe aren't as familiar with Assassin's Creed. Let's say 20% of my pre-existing audience are Assassin's Creed fans. Great. Okay. So that leaves 80% of them who've never engaged with an Assassin's Creed property before. So I want to make it accessible to them while also something that still feels accurate to the brand and accurate to the franchise. But it's also, it's just like anything doing that exists within the IP world. Stan Lee had this great quote that I think about all the time where he said that um, every comic book is somebody's first comic book. And I think about that every time mm. I write because, you know, even the Supernatural Sisters series, right? That's my own IP. But I specifically built those so that even though they were interconnected, eight novels set within the same world, each novel could pick, be picked up and read individually without pre-existing knowledge of the ones before so that nobody was excluded. I'm always trying to find ways to make my storytelling inclusive rather than exclusive. So if you're an Assassin's Creed fan, I think you're going to get more from this novel, obviously, than somebody who isn't. But at the end of the day, like, you know, my grandma read this book and she doesn't know, she has no idea what Assassin's Creed is, but she loves a good yarn. She loves a good story. And for her, this is a story about a She's woman. your grandma. She must be your biggest fan, right? That's what grandmas are there for. <laughs> I guess, maybe. She's actually, more importantly, I, you know, she's a big fan of mine, whatever, who cares? She's a big reader. Like she consumes, <laughs> she reads everything. And so that's really handy because I know that 
um if she's like ah, on something it's like oh shit i need to do better i need to improve that or whatever and so for her being hooked in on this book and engaged in it those are the that's the kind of duality of accomplishment you want it to be something that feels um faithful to the world and exciting to long-term fans of assassin's creed but i also love the idea of maybe this is the first time anyone's been exposed to ac and this is you know this is a, a book that they can read without feeling like they need to do a whole bunch of homework yeah yeah understood um I'll, I'll read the question that I, I wrote and I've just got a little additional part of the question, which I didn't write. Um, how did you give Roshan a, a woman of Persian origin in the ninth century, a convincing backstory? I think you've touched on that. Um, did you need specialist knowledge or did you specifically research the time period to make it more grounded? And just the, the side question that I suddenly thought, because you had a lot of contact with the development team, the other writers, did you did you create kind of a Roshan mood room with her concept arts and different things whilst you were writing or was it all virtual and, and in your mind? Bless your heart that you think I got access to um, endless amounts of Roshan art. I don't think I saw <laughs> a single piece of Roshan artwork or drawing. I um I saw her in clips is um okay. is what I saw. The the, okay. the renderings of her of Roshan that I got access to were through the internet. <laughs> so okay. thank you. A digital the... mood room is not quite the same thing, is it really? No, <laughs> no, no, it's um it's not possible. Um but shout out to everybody who runs the Assassin's Creed wikis and fan pages because those were the ones who put together all of the here's all the renderings for Shan and people yeah. as well as just fan art, just like incredible fan art. She's a lot younger in the novel than she is in the games so it's like you know you're extrapolating from there but sort of just having like a a, a bit of an understanding of um of her physicality and i'm a quite like stout stocky person <laughs> so i love a bit of stocky representation um is what <laughs> i feel that she has but yeah i mean it's again it's it is it is really tricky you're trying to juggle the modern lands and the past lands and there are certain texts that i read certain people that i spoke to it's a little bit different to doing things like for instance um i have a book called who's afraid which is about a werewolf who is from scotland and for shout out james uh and for a, a story like that you think oh okay werewolf well that's a made-up creature like what could you possibly how could you possibly research that but I interviewed a full moon expert. I interviewed um, cryptozoologists. I interviewed, like I went to Dundee, which is where the story is set. Like you're trying oh, to nice. combine the mythological research with the geographical research while also mm. creating and entrenching mm. readers in a world that feels wholly unique and lived in. And with this, there are parts, um, there are places that Rashan visits in the novel that I had been to physically myself. And so it was sort of like trying to capture how those places felt, how they smelled, um, what was the lived in quality of going to those cities, even though when she's visiting those cities is thousands of years before I have. So, you know, like it's carry the one divide by two, you know, it, it, you're, you're really like taking some liberties there, but um, trying to find ways where the things that were really grounded in reality that I could either speak to somebody directly about that or my own primary sourcing about places that i'd been to and things that i'd seen a lot of academic text reading uh yeah. a lot of documentary watching and then a lot of trying to parcel out what other pieces i can use and what are the pieces that i can't because nothing worse um if something gets lost in the source in terms of you've spent an entire page tolkening it right where you're describing a hallway or whatever it's like this is this is a murder book <laughs> this is a, like a an action movie in literary mm. form right so making mm. sure that the story always feels propulsive but that there are those moments where there, if there is a breather or if there is a moment of reprieve that that is paying service to the story very good i'm gonna have a look out for this um book set in dundee now <laughs> Did not oh, who's afraid uh who's afraid too <laughs> who's afraid so it's set in scotland so there you go okay 
Sounds good. <laughs> Definitely be looking into that one. So, um, Roshan spends a lot of time hiding in the House of Wisdom. Actually, one of my favourite parts of the book. Um, did you imagine that building in your mind? Or did you just see it some the concept art or in-game? You can already oh, an- maybe answer that. But I could spend forever talking about the House of Wisdom because it's so fascinating. But for those who let's go. Uh, yeah, let's, <laughs> let's fucking go. Um, you know, like the Library of Alexandria is kind of the sort of um, historical learning epicenter that people more commonly know. But House of Wisdom was just this like amazing place where sometimes it's really wild to me like how regressive like we think we're so progressive in 2023 but it's like actually culture and society is so regressive and the house of wisdom it was like women could be scholars women could enter and learn people from all different races and ethnicities could come and read and learn and study and discuss and it didn't matter it was like this sort of this cathedral of learning and obviously there's all different um historical versions and ideas of what the house of wisdom actually was there's even scholars who believe that it was not a real place but you know majority of the evidence points to it actually being a physical real place that existed but just this idea of this essentially library existing during that time period and during all the different conflicts that start to bubble up around religion in particular, but race as well. And then gender and everything. I just thought it was incredible. And I was fascinated by that. And I just thought for a character like Rashan, who has quite literally come from nothing and come from a very specific town that still exists uh, in a very specific place and has been intentionally kept in the dark because, you know, knowledge is power. People can control you by limiting what you have access to. What is the inverse of that? Suddenly having endless possibilities for growth, both academically, spiritually, culturally, uh, was just exciting to me. I love a library in a, <laughs> in a story. Like I, I love a mystical library. This isn't a mystical library, but just like, you know, I, I just think that it's such a great device, but also for somebody like her, where I think this stereotype for female characters in Assassin's Creed stories is that they're powerful through their physicality. We're giving them, you know, masculine traits, but like being able to punch somebody real good or wield a sword or bow and arrow. But I love that Roshan's first superpower is learning to read. It's learning to do calculations. It's learning about the world through text. And I wanted that to sort of be a quite sharp, sharp juxtaposition to some of the other skills that she picks up as she goes. Because at the end of the day, her being able to think her way out of a problem is just as critical as her being able to smash her way out of a problem. Mm, mm. Yeah, definitely came across, like you said, Chris, that, that whole sequence, first of all, of her hiding and surviving on rats I don't think that's oh. a, too much of a spoiler oh, gross. and then yeah <laughs> she starts to teach herself and then she gets taught by this mysterious benefactor mm. um it was it was great it was a it was a fantastic origin story um what do you hope people will take um from your novel about Roshan what kind of per- person is she really good question I think um I don't want to say noble but I really do feel like that's who she is you know what I mean like I think the version that of Roshan that people get to meet in the games is very fully formed like she really but I mean as you would be by the time you get to your 50s and 60s and shit you're pretty locked in to the person that you are your breadth and uh capacity (laughs) for growth personal Mm. or otherwise is um is pretty capped by that point so I wanted people to see the foundations for her moral and ethical code. I wanted people to sort of understand who she is from that point of view and to Mm. understand how she gets there. You know, like there's so many, so many aspects of the Assassin's Creed world and her time period and the places that she navigates, right. That I 
found so interesting, you know, we talk about the different geographical locations or historical things that she's weaves through like the house of wisdom, but it's also about what kind of music was she exposed to? What kind of foods did she eat? What kind of foods did she like? What were the scents, the tastes, the smells, the sounds of her life? in this time, in this tennis year time period that we first get to meet her. And how does that shape who she is? Like even the point in the Mirage game where she's writing a letter to somebody, uh, I need to be able to explain how she can write for a woman of her status and a woman at that time period. It's not just a given that people in the brotherhood are a hundred percent completely literate, right? So weaving that into the story so that everything feels earned and everything about her feels earned is hopefully for me, what I hope people take away that nothing feels flippant or just like thrown in there everything whether it's a plot point or a personal point that it feels really intentional to Roshan and and who that character is so Darish is named in the novel and and someone a young Roshan works for mm-hmm. I assume this is the same Darish that Passon works for yeah. a few decades later yeah, yeah. it is nice pull <laughs> nice pull yeah um it, it it is the same one that was one of the ones uh like one of the sort of you know many characters and many titans obviously there's some stuff to um Assassin's Creed Dynasty which was like a a manga that I was trying to you know tie in little plot points and character beats too because I think that work was incredible uh and I could never do what they did in terms of like just the depth and the timeline and the artistry but just trying to sort of acknowledge hey I see what you're doing over there within the (laughs) you know various Assassin's Creed tie-in media properties and I think it's cool but um having her be in that city at that specific time was just like well he would be here logically he would be here he's essentially like a you know a master of thieves if you will and that has to start out somewhere so by the time Basim gets there he's a different he's at a different level but to get to that level you have to negotiate through various points so It just made sense by the time the story is inching a little bit closer to timelines where characters like that could overlap. It's like, why would you have just a random character that I could throw in here that you never see again when it could be somebody that we've actually spent a little bit of time with and actually then again strengthens the connection and the connectivity between Roshan and Basim when it happens down the line. She really understands like where he comes from and understands his story in a way that as much as there's a lot of compassion to that relationship to begin with, there's also a lot of lived experience. You know, I think um I think it's very easy for for people to have compassion and sympathy for people whose life's experiences they either recognize or can connect to. That's a great point. I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, she's when, see this, when, when, when Mirage opens, you know, and Basim is doing his early thieving missions, you know, Roshan is right there. And she, she says it, it's so, um, handoff as she says, pay the boy, you know, and then she sort of walks out and he's, he's kind of a minnow in the presence of this giant um but actually yeah she sees him she knows she, he, he's he's at the bottom of of the ladder like she was 20 30 40 years before yeah and i think um I, that's always one of the cool things about assassin's creed as a franchise is that you know the smallest seemingly smallest person can impact history or impact or, or create change positive or ne- negative it can echo through time in a very specific way so I sort of always really liked that about the games broadly but also trying to find ways to weave that ideology into the story where it's like there are no little things actually like nothing is insignificant everything is loaded with story potential and meaning understood yeah yeah um that's the end of our um questions i've just got one final question here which is any any final thoughts any (laughs) any final messages you want to share to people listening no i mean uh like honestly thanks to you guys for number one reading the book but also number two being so engaged with it and coming up with such great questions and being so thoughtful and the things that you asked and um yeah like 
picking up all the little pieces that are put in there. <laughs> like half the time you're putting in stuff to amuse you and amuse, you know, the other uh, Ubisoft people who are as in depth and in the weeds as you are. So when other people pick that stuff up, um, it's really special, but yeah. Any last thoughts? Nah, just like if people like the book, thank you. If people pick it up and read it. Awesome. That's great. There is um, an audio book version out as well, which, um, I didn't know about it until a few days ago and they sent me a clip and I was like, wow, this sounds amazing. <laughs> so that made me really excited. So if maybe um, textual reading is a bit of a slog, there is an audio version as well that I recommend and um, the narration is just incredible. That's great news. That's great. Yeah, it's always good to have the audio version um, as well. All right. Um, well, that's the end of our chat about Daughter of No one. Chris, anything else you want to uh, want to add? I just, uh, I think if you're an Assassin's Creed fan, you will enjoy this book, no doubt. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. that. It's, it's steeped with Creed stuff. We do like <laughs> yeah. books with Creed stuff in. Yeah. Very Creedy. Oh, you know, I've, I've just remembered something. I'm going to ask it. Um, our Assassins, they have a special ability, some mm. more so than others. Um, what's that like to write that um, and make it, like you said, you wanted to write the book for people that understand the franchise, but he also wanted to write the book for people that are new to the franchise. So how do you write the, the Eagle vision, the sixth sense in a way that's <laughs> clear, engaging, bit mysterious, you know, all the rest of it. Is that hard to do or is it, is it quite easy? Oh my God. That is so hard. Actually. That was one of the hardest parts okay. to write because it's such a, like how do you describe it like it's hard to describe without doing it like the thing that makes eagle vision cool uh and like the thing that makes it specific and identifiable to assassin's creed fans is their physical involvement in it you know what i mean like they are like they're part of it right they have an element of control to their experience so taking that away you're just describing something um almost in a passive fashion so i don't want it to be something that's I, don't, I didn't want to like have it described the way it is in the game. Like I was just like watching it happen in the game. Mm. And that's what I'm describing. That's also pretty fucking boring, but the way different people experience it is, is very like unique. So with Rashan, it was all about light and color. That's mm. essentially how I had her experience it. And that's how I was describing it is, you know, for her, she it's, it's basically like a glow, like a fortuitous glow yeah. that's sort of helping direct her through various events and various life points that she doesn't necessarily um, identify as being something that other people can share and experience as well, essentially up until she meets the brotherhood, obviously. Yeah. But it is something that for her has always been special and unique. And I think every every ethnic family has that, you know, like you always, well, at least maybe um, in my family, it's like you have that auntie who always gets like a specific feeling in a specific place. You have the spooky uncle who, you know, can talk to spirits or whatever. And there's all different versions of that, especially in indigenous cultures and um, sort of trying to have Eagle vision be something that was present and ever present throughout her life yeah. and throughout the lives of people who knew her, her family in particular, but it be described as something else because like, how would you have the perspective or knowledge of what that is without exposure to the hidden ones and the brotherhood? So sort of trying to make it feel realistic within her worldview and her knowledge base um, up until the point that she, she meets them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. Thank you very much. Um, well, that is the end of the recording. Uh, Maria, thank you so much for joining us. And what, what is it, nine o'clock in the morning uh, on the other side nine of the world? 9.17 a.m. <laughs> I really appreciate you being up early and, and ready to chat because time zones can be tricky. Um, I appreciate sometimes. you guys so. being up late and um, and appreciate you guys putting up with my tonsillitis oh, and no, pharyngitis. No no. no, 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 no problem at all. Glad, glad you're back. Can't wait glad for that well. tonsil surgery. Let me tell you, <laughs> why not wait till they assassins creed my throat and take these tonsils out? <laughs> Yeah, I don't, if the surgeon walked in and flicked his his wrist, and then that would not be a good uh, time in the theatre. I, I think. Honestly, <laughs> hidden blade. I don't care. Just get them out at this point. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for having me. No, uh, I really great. appreciate it. appreciate it. So, thank you, Maria. Thanks, Chris, for joining me again. Thank you all for listening, and we'll be back uh, very soon.